My intent is to bring to you a message from God's word concerning matters of love and hate. However, before I speak to you concerning matters of love and hate, I want to remind you how important it is to God and how important it should be to you and me to engage in the practice of thanksgiving. Before I read a number of verses to show you the importance of giving thanks, let me read to you Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, a portion of the apostles' inspired description of those who suppress their knowledge of God. Paul writes, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Weren't thankful for their father, weren't thankful for their mother, weren't thankful for the home they were raised in, weren't thankful for the country they lived in, weren't thankful for the sunshine, weren't thankful for the rain, weren't thankful for the food, weren't thankful for the clothes, weren't thankful for anything. But became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts was darkened. Recognizing those whose imaginations are vain, whose foolish hearts are darkened because they refuse to glorify God, we see from Paul's letter that they are also characteristically ingrates. Does that not describe so much of our present culture? Do we not have a nation of ingrates, ingratitude, unthankful they think they, they they are thankful for nothing now do you know someone who is unthankful has has someone come to mind as i've mentioned this that you recognize is not appreciative such parents should recognize that these patterns are typical of far worse spiritual issues than most people recognize. Let me now turn to thankfulness. Listen, please, as I read Psalm 50, verse 14, Offer unto, the, uh, offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Psalm 69, 30. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Psalm 95, verse 2. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. Psalm 107 verse 22. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And declare his works with rejoicing. Psalm 116 verse 17. I will offer to thee the, th the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. Psalm 147 and verse 7. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 9.11 Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Colossians 2, 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And then Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So from the psalmist to the prophet Jonah inside the belly of the great fish in the Old Testament and, and from the apostle Paul's second Corinthian letter and two of his prison epistles in the New Testament, we see how important is the practice and habit of God's people 
to express thanksgiving to him, both in the private utterances of our prayer closets as well as the gathered assemblies of our public worship. Amen? Thank you, Sai. Amen? Are you enjoying God's rich bounty of blessings? You guys look like you're in pretty good shape, fairly well fed. Then you ought to express your thanks to God in private and as well as in public. Are you suffering heartache and loss, perhaps physical pain? Do you imagine there were no expressions of thanksgiving mingled with Paul and Silas's prayers and praises to God heard by the others in the Philippian jail? Acts chapter 16, verse 25. When was the last time you looked to heaven and said, thank you, Lord? Have you ever done that? Have you done that recently? Have you done that today? What mental picture do you have of Daniel as an old man in the lion's den in which he is not giving thanks to God? I'm, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm glad the big guy is not eating me. And I'm glad the little guy is not eating me. And I'm thankful that you got me through the night. Can you imagine him not saying or doing that? The verses that I read to you about thanksgiving contain little information concerning what God is being thanked for, only that God's people are thereby encouraged to form the habits and practice of thanking God for everything. If you doubt that, listen as I read what the Apostle Paul wrote to the new converts in Thessalonica. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. As you make your way to John chapter 15 verse 17, please keep in mind that we have quickly reviewed what we have quickly reviewed about this matter of thanksgiving. And remember that it is characteristic of the unsaved to display ingratitude, to be unthankful, to not count their blessings. On the other hand, during both pleasant and unpleasant experiences, we see that a cultivated characteristic pattern of God's people is thankfulness. Let me say again that the prophet Jonah expressed a commitment to thanking God in the future when he was in the belly of the great fish. <laughs> and Paul's instructional epistle written to new Christians very directly asserts that God's will for your life is to give thanks in everything. Amen. Now that you've arrived at John chapter 15 verse 17, let us recall that the Lord Jesus Christ is leading his 11 remaining apostles from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane after celebrating the Passover with them and instituting the communion of the Lord's Supper. Along the way that evening, he declared to them that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. Farther along the way, he identified himself as the true vine, with his father said to be the husbandmen and believers likened to branches of the vine that bear fruit. However, life for those men was not going to be a cluster of grapes, was it? Hmm? Not at all. As the Lord Jesus Christ walked with them toward the Garden of Gethsemane, and would leave them behind to go to the cross of Calvary, the good shepherd first took occasion to prepare his little flock for what was in store for them. Persecution. I invite you to stand and read with me John chapter 15, verses 17 through 21. 
I will read verses 17, 19, and 21 aloud, and I would like you at the proper time and with the right kind of inflection to read verses 18 and 20 good and loud. These things I command you that you love one another. If the Lord hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Won't you please be seated? Again, the issue those men would soon face was persecution, withering persecution. How their shepherd prepared them for what they would face was by first issuing them a command, next voicing to them a caution, and then providing for them a rehearsal of the causes. The Lord directs his men, then he warns his men, and then he elaborates to his men. However, remember that I began by addressing the issue of gratitude and thanksgiving. What those men should be thankful for and what they would learn to express their thankfulness for was the preparation they were given even before they knew what they were being prepared for. And the same is true of you. And the same is true of me. There is a reason why we should always give thanks to God. Do you have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ? That is sufficient reason in and of itself for gratitude appreciated and expressed. Amen? Amen. Additionally, as with those 11 men, we are being looked after and we are being cared for even when we do not realize what is happening. And I say we, I'm talking about those who are blood-bought, blood-washed believers in Jesus Christ. Therefore, you and I ought to purpose to thank God even when we don't know what for. In due time, we will know what for. And we'll look back and we'll be thankful that we were thankful. <coughs> Three observations in our text show us how the Savior began to prepare his little flock for the persecution that was about to fall on them with force and fury. First, we observe the Savior's command. Verse 17, these things I command you that you love one another. When seeking to discover Bible truth, we know to ask who, what, why, where, and how. We know that. We already know where. Jerusalem, somewhere between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane. We already know when. Thursday evening, the night before our Lord's crucifixion. The how is obvious. The Savior is instructing them. What remains for us to discover from verse 17 is the who and the what and the why. Let us ask who is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to? What is abundantly clear is that he is walking with the 11 remaining apostles, Judas Iscariot having been dismissed from the upper room to complete his conspiracy of betrayal. What is overlooked by most who study this portion of God's word is that these men are distinguished by the fact that the Savior invited them to the Passover celebration he hosted, and they were present 
when he instituted the communion of the Lord's Supper. Why was his mother Mary not invited? Why were his half-brothers who were in Jerusalem not invited? Why were Mary, Martha, and Lazarus who lived a short distance away not invited? Kind of throws out the window that celebrating the communion of the Lord's Supper is necessary for salvation. If it was necessary for salvation, he would have had them there. These men are more than the remaining apostles of Jesus Christ, a disconnected group of disciples following the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. No, 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 they're more than that. They, they are the church of Jesus Christ, our Lord's little flock, Luke chapter 12 and verse 32. Granted, they have not yet been indwelt by the Spirit. The Spirit would be given to them following Christ's resurrection. As well, the other disciples are not yet incorporated into the church of Jesus Christ, as would be the case leading up to the day of Pentecost, so that on the day of Pentecost, the church numbered 120 at the beginning of the day, and 3,120 at the end of the day. Uh, quite a growth curve, wouldn't you say? This, then, is a fuller satisfaction of our curiosity about precisely who the Lord is speaking to and why his mother, his brothers, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were not invited to celebrate the Passover with them in the upper room. Who? The church of Jesus Christ, the little flock, before greater numbers were added. The final question that remains unanswered is what? What is the Lord Jesus doing at this point by commanding them to love one another? Concerning the disciples' love one to another, commanded as evidence of their love to Christ and a grateful return for his love of them, we must, we must keep his commandments. And this is his commandment that we love one another. John 15 verse 12 and here, verse 17. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 17 again, these things I command you, that you love one another. There is no spiritual obligation that is more frequently commanded, nor more urgently pressed upon us by our Lord Jesus Christ than that of mutual love and for good reason. This is especially important for the church congregation. It is here recommended by Christ's pattern, as we saw in John 15, 12, as I have loved you, as if to reinforce the importance of this command in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Paul writes, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ's love of and for his followers should direct and engage our love to and for each other. In this manner, and from this motive, we should love one another as and because Christ has loved those who have trusted him. But beyond that, our Lord specifies some of the expressions of his love to his church. He called those men particularly friends in John 15 verse 13 and verse 14 and verse 15. Then he communicated his mind to them and, and was ready to give them what they asked. How that should inform our attitude toward the church. our posture toward the congregation is required by his precept. Our Lord interposes his authority and has made love for one another in the congregation to be one of the statute laws of his church. Observe how Differently, the command is expressed in these two verses, and both in very emphatic fashion. This is my commandment, John 15, verse 12. 
as if this were the most necessary of all commandments. As under the law of Moses, the prohibition of idolatry was the commandment more insisted on than any other, foreseeing the Jewish people's addiction to that sin. So Christ, foreseeing that persecution of Christian congregations is best coped with by love, has laid his greatest stress upon this duty that we love one another. Do you think 2021 is going to be a year of withering opposition and persecution? All the more need for you and me to love each other. And then in verse 17, these things I command you. He speaks here as if he were about to give them many directives, yet he names only this one, that they love each other, not only because this includes many of our duties in our congregational life, but because it best prepares members of congregations to deal with persecutions. Do you want to prepare to deal with persecution? Do you want to prepare your family to deal with persecutions? Then you'd best be here and loving one another you'd best not be home thinking you have a reason for not preparing for persecution. Next, we observe the Savior's caution. Verse 18, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Those of you who are familiar with John's 15th chapter may have read it enough to appreciate the major themes that are found in it. In verses 1 through 8, our Lord speaks of fruit using the wonderful allegory of the husbandman, the vine, the branch, and the fruit. As I mentioned before, with his emphasis on abiding, verses 9 through 17 deal with love from a variety of perspectives, beginning with the Father's love for him in verse 9, concluding with his directive for his apostles, the infant church, to love one another in verse 17. And beginning in verse 18 and continuing through verse 25, we're not going to go that far really in our study. Before he speaks of the Holy Spirit of God, he cautions the church about hatred. So love, 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 hatred. Wow. We need to arm ourselves against the onslaught of hatred. Hatred from others is best counted countered with love for one another. You say, well, pastor, how do I deal with such hatred? By loving me, by me loving you, and by us loving the brethren. That's the way you cope with hatred. Before we narrow our focus to John chapter 15, verse 18, I, I want to read verses 18 through 25 quickly to provide you with an overview of where the Lord took his church as they walked from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane he said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, uh, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not sinned. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not sinned. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Do, do you see how effectively the Lord Jesus Christ pointed out the harsh but true reality of the spiritual realm? His goal was to not only teach his church about their relationship with God, 
and with him that ought to be reflected in their conduct toward each other, he also showed how diametrically opposed to God, to the Savior, and to believers they are who are in and of the world as unbelieving rebels against God and rejectors of Christ. They are all about hatred, no matter how nicely they behave themselves at the dining room table. Too many believers in Christ think they are demonstrating kindness by disputing what our Lord said in this passage, but they're only denying reality. They really do hate us. They really do hate us. Adjust your focus now, please, to verse 18. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. To get a handle on the meaning of verse 18, I want to consider it in three ways. First, the structure of the verse. Next, the first phrase. And then the final phrase. A.T. Robertson, the Greek scholar of days gone by, reminds us that in John chapter 15, verse 18, we have a first-class conditional statement. He writes, If the world hateth you, as it certainly does. Now, what does that mean? The first-class condition affirms the reality of the condition using a certain Greek word meaning if. This construction confirms the condition, close quote. Recognizing this verse to be a conditional statement of the first class is crucial to understanding the first phrase. If the world hate you, uh, there is no doubt the world hates you, is the essence of our Lord's comment to his young church. It is then left to us to understand what is meant by the word translated world and the word translated hate. In John's gospel, the Greek word for world, cosmos, is used to mean at least seven different things. The word world refers in this verse to the created moral order in active rebellion against God. This same apostle John writes of the world in the same sense, 1 John Chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 19, I read, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. 1 John 5 19. Who then hates believers in Jesus Christ, especially, especially do they hate committed church members? Unsaved people, all unsaved people, every unsaved person who comprise the collective of individuals who are each and also arrayed together against God, and also the plan, the purpose, the people of God, and the church of God. Remember, the Lord did say in Luke chapter 11, verse 23, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Now to ascertain what is meant by the word hate. Translating the Greek word meseo, the word meseo, the Lord informed his church that the world of unsaved men hated him. It is an ongoing and continual hatred, despite the abilities of different unsaved people to convince themselves that they do not hate us, and the opinions of some believers that the unsaved do not hate us, the implication, of course, being that the Lord doesn't know what he's talking about. Ooh, you want to be careful about that. The Lord Jesus Christ insists they do hate us. Our command and our commitment is to love. The world's stated commitment is to hate. And how very different they are from us, amen? It is a difference that must not be overlooked or minimized. Love them 
while recognizing their hatred of us. Amen? You can walk and chew gum at the same time, most of you. Finally, we observe the Savior's causes. The Lord Jesus Christ provided his men with four interrelated causes for the hatred and the subsequent persecution he cautioned them about in the first half of verse 18 and that he prepared them to deal with by commanding them to love one another in verse 17. First, the cause of their hatred for you is their already existing hatred for him. You know that it hated, that it being the world, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The verb form of the same Greek word translated hated in this verse is perfect, meaning a permanent attitude of hatred is being referred to. Thus, the Lord Jesus Christ here informs his church that the world of unsaved individuals under the control and influence of the devil has a permanent hatred for and toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you sure? Uh, they did crucify him. Amen? I mean, they, they did kill him. Think about this dynamic for a moment. We know that God loves Christ. God loves us. Christ loves all believers, and Christ loves his church. We are therefore to love God. We are therefore to love Christ. We are therefore to love all believers and especially love each other in the church. That's the new commandment I give unto you. But the world hates us because it hates our Savior. Yet there is always the tendency of believers, I have observed sadly, there is always the tendency of believers to love the world that hates us and to love the world that hates our God and our Savior. And that is really kind of messed up. Next, a further cause of their hatred for you is your difference from them. Verse 19, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Although we see the word ye twice and the word you twice in this verse in our version of the Bible, the, the Greek pronoun is only used twice by our Lord. Our Lord was addressing his immediate comments to the little flock accompanying him on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was not then, he was not in this verse addressing the broader expanse of believers. He was talking to the little flock. Those he was speaking to, the still small in number, Church of Jesus Christ, were not of the world and were chosen out of the world. Therefore, they were because of that hated by the world. You know, when someone in a social group is perceived to be abandoning that group in favor of another group, the first group is typically resentful and feels rejected. Add on top of that the sinful inclinations and motives of the unsaved, and you can easily understand why former friends, relatives, colleagues, and people in general will feel antagonistic toward you when you come to Christ and become a member of a church. They feel you've rejected them, and, and in fact you have. But the way you reject them is not the way they would reject you. The way you reject them is you step across the line and you reach back for them. Because you want them to come to Christ. Also, keep in mind that it is the difference from them that inflames them. No child of God is sinlessly perfect. <laughs> we know that. But if you display the differences associated with obedient Christianity, personal holiness, and an involvement in a church ministry that occupies your time and devotion, they will hate you. After all, the world demands conformity and sameness. I remember when I was an engineering student at Oregon State University back in the late 60s, early 70s, 
being a primarily an engineering school, most of the students at that time were quite conservative, but we had a humanities and social studies department and stuff, and they were wildly liberal. And, and they wanted to be different from everybody, and here's how they were different. They wore VC thongs. Anybody remember what VC thongs are? They're shower thongs made out of car tires. They were imitating the Viet Cong. They, had, they wore VC thongs for footwear. They wore green GI fatigues. They had the obligatory quarter inch uh, cotton rope as a belt, the clothesline as a belt. They had the obligatory backpack. And, and you notice they always walk this way. They always walk that way. You, you can't walk like this. You had to walk like this. And they had long hair, shaggy beard, and the obligatory leather headband. They were all exactly alike while claiming that they were all different. And if you didn't look like them, walk like them, talk like them, smoke weed like them, drink cheap wine like them, then they hated you. They hated you. Yeah, ring Rogers Hall and try to keep engineering students out of their classes. Go ahead and try. See how far it gets you to try to keep someone who's already paid his tuition to not get the most out of his tuition. Now things are quite different. They are intolerant of differences and have always been intolerant of differences. Compromise your Christianity, uh, choose them over the Savior, and choose them over others in the congregation, and they will tolerate you. But there will be wrath if you display what they perceive to be differences resulting from Christ choosing you. Third, yet another cause of the world's hatred for us is our likeness to him. Verse 20 reads, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. In, in this verse, there are three important points to make, which I will deal with in four parts. First, our Lord issues a directive to the congregation of eleven, a command, Remember the word that I said unto you. The Greek word translated remember translates a Greek word pertaining to memory. It's an imperative verb, meaning our Lord is telling his men what they are to do. They, they are to remember what he had earlier taught them, which he restates here. This would be effectively the third time the command is issued, right? Next, our Lord repeats that he, what he had said in the upper room immediately after he washed the apostles' feet. He said then... The servant is not greater than his Lord. He says again here, the servant is not greater than his Lord. This is an exact quote from John 13, 16. The apostle does not typically quote verbatim what he refers to, but he does here, suggesting to us, this is an important reminder. The context reinforces the importance of the reminder. The question is, what does the Lord mean by this statement? He continues to prepare them for the rough treatment they will receive from the world by pointing out that no servant is greater than his Lord. That is a universally accepted principle, meaning if the world has no hesitation about resisting the Son of God, if the world has no qualms about opposing the Son of God, if the world gives not a second thought, about crucifying the Son of God, who do you think you are that you think the world is going to hesitate to treat you properly? We should not expect treatment from the world to be any different than their treatment of our Lord. Amen? Amen. Now comes the specific explanation of the general principle our Lord just stated in the form of a first-class conditional sentence using the familiar... You're going to get so sick and tired of this by the time you go to heaven. 
If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have persecuted me, and they both have and will persecute you, then they will do likewise to you. The specific word used by the Lord translated persecute means to pursue. In context, it has here to do with chasing someone, which is why it is translated persecuted. Here I'm wondering if, if the Lord had spoken in 2021, if he would not have referred to it as doxing. What irony, the Lord Jesus Christ using a word related to following someone, but with a context that shows the following is not as a disciple, but as a harasser. Not as a disciple, but as a stalker. Not as a disciple, but as a persecutor seeking to do harm. If they did that to the Son of God, the sinless Savior, he points out, that they will also persecute you. This word is used in the first half of this statement and also in the second half, dioko. In the first half, the verb refers to that which is being done to the Savior, with the second use of the verb being a future tense form, persecution of the church of Christ <coughs> and all subsequent congregations and believers has not commenced, but it will, but it will. We observe their persecution in the book of Acts. And we see the apostles Paul and Peter addressing the certainty of Christian persecution. Writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, the apostle Paul asserts, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Here's a portion of Peter's comments related to a Christian's persecution in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. So for the last 2,000 years, the Lord's prediction to the 11 has been fulfilled in Christian history. And the relative freedom from religious persecution that has been enjoyed in this country for the most part for the last two centuries has been a departure from the norm. <coughs> it may soon become the more common experience of Americans professing to be Christians. The last phrase of verse 20 reads, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Pay attention to the fact that this phrase is said in the midst of comments before and after dealing with the hatred of Christ and his followers by the world. Therefore, the Lord means, and his men understood him to mean, if they have kept my saying, and they most certainly have not, they will keep yours also in the same way they have not kept my saying. What the Savior is seeking to accomplish in this verse is a question that needs to be asked. The Lord Jesus Christ reinforcing his apostles' understanding of something he had initially stated minutes earlier to reinforce his comment from John chapter 13 and verse 16. Do not think you can stand by and watch the world unleash its fury and venom on the Son of God and hope to escape their attention. Because the servant is not greater than his Lord, what the world heaps on the Savior, the world will heap on the Savior's people alike. The statements are designed to impress upon the apostles that the world's opposition to the Savior will guarantee the world's opposition to the Savior's own. Meaning? Meaning there is a price to pay for being a disciple of Christ. The cost of privilege is high. However, as Paul pointed out in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen. Finally, the world hates us because of our association with God, verse 21. 
But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Though the Lord Jesus is presenting the reasons why the world hates them so, it is in this verse that he seems to distill the reason for their hatred of us down to its essence. Recall what our Lord said moments ago in John 15, 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own, but because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The world loves worldlings. The world loves the worldly. What the world will not tolerate, however, is essential difference. For that reason, because God's people are not of the world, but have been chosen by Christ out of the world, the world irrationally, the world viscerally, the world hates us. It is an illogical, unreasoning, gut-level intolerance of our spiritual difference and is a reflection of their hatred of God. Those of you who recently were brave enough to try to make Christmas about Christ instead of about presents, likely saw proof of what I said. They won't tolerate it. Another cause of the world's hatred of the apostles comprising the church and by extension us it's because they belonged to Christ as we belong to Christ. Here is the real core of the controversy. Whatever is pretended, this is the basis of their quarrel with us. The world hates Christ's disciples because they bear his name and lift up his name in the world. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake. It is the character of Christ's disciples that we stand up for his name. That's just what we do. This standing up for Christ begins with believer baptism and continues for the rest of our lives. It is what we live and die for. The history of the Christian faith is a history of such suffering for Christ. Peter wrote about this in 1 Peter 4, 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And he reflected the experiences of the early Christians as we see in Acts chapter 5, verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. But did not the Lord Jesus Christ warn his disciples again and again throughout his earthly ministry that persecution awaited them? Yes, he most certainly did. Thus, their experience was precisely what their Savior had predicted. It is in the last half of John 15, 21 that the underlying reason back of all persecution of Christians is found. Be it pagan and Jewish persecution of early disciples, Islamic persecution of Christians throughout the Middle East, North Africa and Europe beginning in the 7th century and persecution of the faithful by the Roman Catholic Church in Europe during the era of the Inquisition, the foundation reason is the same because they know not him that sent me. Do you have family members who launch into tirades against you for being a Christian? for attending church, for believing the Bible, for forsaking the lifestyle you lived before turning to Christ? Or to this point, have they just insinuated in an intimidating way what may be in store for you if you don't come around? The reasons for persecution from these people is typically the same. They they persecute you, rail against you, falsely accuse you, spew invective in your direction, threaten in so many words to withhold your grandchildren from you. That's a thing. And 
and seek everything but your interests because they know not God. This is not a new thing. Notice what the psalmist wrote a thousand years before the Savior's birth. In Psalm 14, verses 1 through 4, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. Thus, according to verse 4, they devour us the way they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. If they were that way a thousand years before Christ, should the world be any different when faced with a son of God come to take away the sins of the world? No. They know not God as he sent the Lord Jesus and authorized him to be the great mediator between God and men. So it is no surprise at all that they crucified the Savior and so strongly oppose. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, which none of the apostles of this world knew, or excuse me, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The issue, of course, is knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ. Unsafe people do not grasp, and surprisingly few Christians behave as though they understand that you cannot just know God and know Christ. You cannot just know God and you cannot just know Christ. To know God by knowing Christ changes a person. Leaving that individual forever changed, altered for eternity. That is how one who was an enemy of God becomes a servant of Christ when he comes to know Christ by faith. That's what happens. The issue that determines which side of this great divide a person is on is simple to grasp. Do you know Christ? Do you thereby, do you thereby know God? If not, for you, all is lost. All is lost. You must come to Christ Amen. or all is lost. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. Help us to be appreciative believers. Help us to recognize that you care for us, watch over us, protect us, provide in so many ways that we are unaware of that it behooves us to simply adopt a posture and an attitude of thanksgiving even when we don't always know what we're thanking you for because you're always good, you always do good, and you've promised to look after us and conform us to the image of Christ. Help us to respond to the hatred of the world with wisdom and understanding, recognizing that no individual, however vitriolic, however angry, no matter what kind of venom they spew forth to us and seek to threaten us, they are not our enemy. Each one should be the object of our love and our prayers. We know that with fear there is torment. Help us not to fear them or, or what they will do because there is always you. No matter what their threats, no matter what their actions, there is always you because you hear and you 
answer our prayers. Bless to that end and draw the lost to Christ. And we will for that thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.